Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Dr Gina Zafia and I am the Research Manager at Ahuri. I'm delighted to host this next instalment in the Ahuri Research Webinar Series. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I am hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters throughout Australia. Before we commence today's webinar, Ahuri is pleased to announce that the National Housing Conference will be held Wednesday 2nd to Friday 4th, March 2022. And for the first time, the conference will be both in person and virtual. Registrations are open and you can see details on the screen now. Before I introduce today's topic and speakers, I need to provide you with a few instructions. The webinar is being recorded, so if you need to leave at any stage, you will be able to return to it later or you can forward it on to a colleague. The recording will be on the Ahuri website in the coming days. Later today, you will receive an email with a survey. Your feedback is very welcome and will help us refine and improve future webinars to ensure we are presenting information that is useful to you. In relation to participating in today's webinar, here are some instructions. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions by typing them in the Q&A section on the right of the presentation screen. You can submit your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collate these and address as many of them as we can during the Q&A segment. Today, we've opened up the chat function if you'd like to share your thoughts with other participants. This can also be found on the right of the presentation screen. However, please ensure that you enter your questions for the panel into the Q&A. Now let's focus on today's topic and presenters. I am delighted to facilitate today's webinar, Discrimination in Private Rental Housing. Our presenter today is Dr. Sophia Nelson from the University of Sydney. Sophia is the lead author of Ahuri's report, Understanding Discrimination Effects in Private Rental Housing, which examines discrimination and existing policy law and practice in Australia's private rental sector, including the impact of informal tenancies and the increasing role of digital technologies. The report, along with the policy evidence summary and the standalone executive summary, are now available at the Ahuri website, as well as in the handout section to the right of your screen. Sophia Malson is a senior lecturer in the School of Architecture, Design and Planning at the University of Sydney. Her research is predominantly situated at the intersection of the digital and material across urban spaces and governance, housing and feminism. Sophia is interested with the way digital technologies mediate and reconfigure housing, the urban and the everyday. We also welcome John Engler, CEO of Shelter New South Wales, as the respondent following the research presentation. John has been involved in the formation, development and operation of social, affordable and specialist housing for most of his professional life, having spent a number of years in the private, public and community sectors. So the format for today's webinar is a research presentation from Sophia, followed by a short industry response from John. After that, I will facilitate a discussion with our two participants, including the Q&A session. And again, please ask a question at any time throughout the presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you our presenter, Dr. Sophia Malson. Thanks. Thanks, Gina. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today with you and with John. I'm very excited that we were able to get John for our industry uh, sector uh, perspective today. Um, before I start, I too would like to acknowledge the tradition of custodianship of the land on which I'm coming from today, which is Gadigal country, and I acknowledge their leaders past, present and emerging. Um, perhaps if you're coming from elsewhere, you can pop in the chat which land you're coming from. Um, so let me just get used to driving this. Here we go. So those who are joining today may have experienced discrimination when accessing the private rental sector or know of people who have. It may not always be easy to identify as discrimination can be subtle. 
but it has important implications for people's ability to access housing and is becoming increasingly important as more people become renters. Questions pertaining to discrimination in the private rental sector are the subject of our recent Uhuri report, produced by Dr. Peter Wallison, Dr. Dallas Rogers, Dr. D Jacqueline Nelson, Dr. Caitlin and Buckle and self, and on whose behalf I am presenting today, would like to thank you for joining us. So, in what we examine discrimination and existing policy, law, and practice in Australia's private rental sector, including the impact of new and emergent mechanisms of discrimination. Australia's rental sector grew by 38% between 2006 and 2016 with almost a third of households, 2.3 million, renting in 2017 to 2018. So this means a corresponding increase in the experience of particular groups being discriminated against on the basis of things such as their race, gender, age, or other factors. The areas for discrimination are wide in scope, and so I will point you to the report for a more comprehensive analysis of that. And for today's webinar, I will focus on how uh, highlight the intersectional nature of discrimination and also look at the opportunity for discrimination that comes with the rise of informal housing sectors and the uptake of technologies and platforms across the rental sector. But before we delve into that, I'll briefly outline some key findings and concepts around discrimination. So what is discrimination? Well, in its basic form, it means treating someone unfairly because they belong to a particular group of people. It can be based on race, gender, age, sexuality, disability and religion, among other factors, and is amplified by the intersection of two or more of these characteristics. There are laws at Australian state and territory government levels that are intended to prevent discrimination. But despite this, it still remains a key issue in the private rental market. Individual bias, for example, means that specific subjective judgments are often made by landlords and real estate agents, as well as other tenants about the characteristics of potential renters beyond what may be apparent on their rental applications. These judgments may be based on negative stereotypes or ideologies and generalizing of past experiences and are inextricable from structural and institutional drivers of discrimination. Since discrimination in the private rental sector reflects and reproduces wider structures of disadvantage, it's critical to address the issue beyond just the PRS in its um, in its own sort of context, um, as well as addition, uh, in addition to tackling it within the sector. So we know that discrimination can take various forms and can be subtle. For example, ethnic minorities may be required to provide more information when applying for a property, including more detailed information on employment, relationship status and family size, or be given misinformation about available properties. Real estate agents may invest less time in, with certain applicants and be less courteous. These experiences of discrimination aren't particularly always overt, and as such, it's actually quite difficult to identify and respond to effectively. In the report, we identified some key groups that experience discrimination, and many of these won't be a surprise to you. So we have Indigenous Australians, um, ethnic minorities and non-white Australians, people from low socioeconomic groups, young people, they're perceived to be less responsible tenants with having limited experience of living um, outside the family home, students, and within this there's variations between postgraduate and undergraduate, uh, domestic and international, families, as well as lone parents experience great, experiencing greater discrimination when trying to access housing, and people with pets as well, older people, and this can also take the form of harassment, um, verbal and financial abuse, disrepair and eviction, um, gender, there's some interesting uh, perceptions about men as less likely to engage in housework and being riskier tenants, whereas women are, are considered to be better behaved and less problematic, less likely to cause property damage. Victims of domestic violence, um, this belief associated that somehow the, the crime will follow them to the new dwelling, and also uh, along the lines of sexual orientation. So it's important to remember that someone's experience of discrimination may be compounded because they believe, belong to more than one of these groups that are being discriminated against. So they could, for example, be a young uh, Indigenous male or a single parent and a victim of domestic violence. So recognising this, what we call intersectional experience of discrimination is a key point of the report. 
So intersectionality posits that social identities like race, class, gender, and age are interdependent. And the theory recognises that a person may experience prejudice across more than one of these social identities. So this combinational intersection of factors will impact the individual in different ways. And rather than seeking to understand their effects separately, this approach recognises the complex and differential character of these identities in relation to the societal circumstances and systems in which they operate. So this figure illustrates how an inter individual's intersecting identity is situated in broader social and systematic contexts. Um, for example, a person's individual characteristics, such as a race or gender, contextualised in broader systems of discrimination, um, will influence their ability to access home ownership and where they are placed within the private rental sector. In turn, their experience is further impacted by the broader social context and policy landscape, which continues to shape their experience and opportunities within the housing system. So again, it's like thinking about how these various factors compound an individual's experience. And our research highlighted the need for a more comprehensive intersectional approach to effectively understand and respond to discrimination in the private rental sector. We also identified some drivers of discrimination, and there's some usual suspects here, such as financialization, suburb-based discrimination, as well as poorly maintained housing. So the report verified, again, the, the central importance of the financialization of housing in shaping discrimination. Again, it's because part of the basic factor that the housing market excludes those who can't afford to buy. So there's already this uh, discrimination built into that. And not only does it exclude people, but also because the housing form, size and quality will begin instead to reflect investor demand rather than tenant needs. There's also an uneven relationship between tenants and landlords, which is at the heart of some of the discriminatory practices. There's little incentive for landlords to provide repair and maintenance because capital gains are predominantly driven by land debt uh, rather than housing quality. And at the same time, the insecurity faced by renters disincentivizes property upkeep. Suburb-based discrimination is the idea that there's good suburbs and bad suburbs and that someone who's previously been in a bad suburb makes a less desirable tenant. This is also linked to uh, elements of geography, income and, and social factors. So those on lower incomes are unlikely to afford uh, housing close to the amenities and services that they need, so they're pushed further out. And then there's increased financial costs of having to commute into jobs or services. And again, this rolls on and compounds the problem. And poorly maintained housing. I mean, there's been a lot of excellent research done on this over the last couple of years uh, for Ahuri by some of my colleagues in other, in other universities which points to the costs of poorly maintained rental properties that compound again um, the experience for tenants. So when we're talking about affordability in housing, we need to account for the cost of running the home, particularly energy consumption. And with poorly maintained houses and little incentive to install suitable and cheaper energy systems, um, we can see the cost increase in long term for tenants. This will only increase as climate change drives more extreme weather events, which will push the pressure on the needs for cooling and heating, and it will make renters even more vulnerable. So we need to think about these other policy areas that surround this when thinking about housing this way, so energy and sustainability. But we also identified some new and emerging mechanisms of discrimination. Uh, so these are the growth of the informal housing sector and also the increasing uptake of digital technologies and platforms that are used to mediate access to and manage the private rental sector. So discrimination in the private rental sector has been exacerbated by growth in the informal sector, which essentially exposes more people with a, a, without a legally binding lease to the threat of unregulated rental discrimination and very limited security of tenure and other rights. Informality in housing markets is understood to mean accommodation or tenants that violate formal uh, building or rental tenancy legislation or offer residents lower levels of protection under those laws. In Australia, the definition includes many secondary dwellings and some forms of homelessness, such as improvised dwellings, and also some boarding houses. So the increase in share households 
also creates additional opportunities for discriminations and share housing can be at times considered part of the informal uh, sector. The increase the increase, um, sorry, in discrimination is because the access to share housing is influenced by the prejudices of not only real estate landlords, um, real estate agents and landlords, but also the tenants, the future flatmates themselves. Share housing in Australia is growing as people increasingly can't afford to even rent on their own. And this accounts for much of the sort of substantial increase in informal tenancies. The increase relates to declining affordability of key urban housing markets and prior to COVID at least, an increasingly mobile labour force. So the growth of informal um, dwellings um, in trans often translates into poorer and often illegal conditions being endured more often. And informal tenancies often advertise on un or under-regulated digital platforms that provide opportunities for discrimination. So platforms such as Gumtree uh, and flatmates.com very lightly regulated and, and can be quite predatory in some or discriminatory in some cases. At the same time, however, informality can offer tenants agency over their space and accommodation that might not otherwise have been available to them. So it's a delicate balance. Digital technologies um, are also rapidly growing alongside this uh, increase in renting. And these have reshaped how tenants, landlords and agents navigate the private rental sector. So the real estate industry talks about these technologies as property technology or prop tech. And prop tech has been heavily critiqued for serving the interests of those with real estate assets while further disadvantaging renters. And complicit with um, existing social, economic and political inequalities, as well as creating new discriminatory environments and dynamics. So these technologies, whether apps um, or automated management systems or online housing markets are at risk of reproducing and existing, uh, reproducing existing, as well as creating new housing inequalities. They're being incorporated into the everyday life of a renter and a landlord in ways that shape provision, consumption and management of rental housing. Beyond investing in and accessing the rental market, technology is increasingly being used to screen and manage tenants. And this is one area of which our report um, sort of highlighted as an area of concern. So online housing markets are predominantly digitally segregated, um, particularly around race, class and cultural preferences. And online listings mediate access to housing by reinforcing these existing inequalities and traditional information segregation patterns. This is also affected by the digital divide and the ability to use the internet. Online share housing platform advertisements can also specify tenant characteristics about gender, race, age and sexuality, lifestyle, for example, as well, which are not permissible in the formal rental sector. So this informal practice reflects the intimate household relationships that sharers must form to, to secure housing, but it adds an extra layer of discrimination. So let's take a closer look at the potential of some of these digital technologies um, in terms of their potential for discrimination. This table is an intermediate outline of some of these property technologies as they potentially contribute to discrimination across the rental system. And it's based on previous work by the authors as well as uh, information from the expert panel that we um, consulted during the research. So for example, we start even before with entered the rental market with the procurement and investment of rental properties. And we have things such as fractional real estate companies, which encourage fractional um, investment, so buying part of a house. So this is discriminatory not only in the way that inflates property market, but it also changes the relationship between real estate investors and rental properties. So it's all that market-based exclusion. Advertising and tenant selection is another key area. So we have an increase in, in um, you know, online advertising platforms, which we've previously referred to, but also things such as rent bidding apps. Um, these are discriminatory in the way or have potential discriminatory effects in the way that they change the relationship between landlords and tenants. Um, in some cases, a landlord can choose the winning uh, rent bid in an eBay style max bid rental auction, but it also changes the interfaces through which you have to go through to connect either with your agent or tenant. The problem with technology broadly, which becomes a recurring thing there, is that actually we know that technology is biased and that algorithms aren't um, objective despite 
discussions that say that they are. There are a lot of, um, it's not always purposeful device, it can be unconscious, but a lot of the data, a lot of the um, coding decisions, the calculative decisions are all only as good as those of the people who make them and the data that's drawn upon. We also see prop tech moving into areas of the bond space, um, you know, which is offering a, a bond loan or insurance for people who can't afford a bond up front. As with um, most uh, bond systems, it may allow a tenant to access capital up front, but the overall cost is more due to increased um, due to interest or fees. So again, it's penalizing those people who don't have enough money to begin with in the first place to secure um, uh, the total bond. Once we get during the tenancy, we have um, you know new ways of asking for repairs and maintaining the place. Um, also, things around accessing buildings. So, particularly, we're seeing in the US, for example, a rise in surveillance technologies, including um, biometric entry systems and smart locks, which also monitor tenants' movements in the buildings. And we see this sort of hyper collection of data on tenants. Um, there's some real concerns around who gets to collect this data and who this data is shared with. Not so much in Australia, but in the US, for example, there's a lot of concern around whether this data is shared with immigration, for example, or police. There's also, you know, an issue with putting smart locks on a building when you may have older residents who will find this uh, potentially challenging. We're also moving into the eviction space where we see automated eviction technologies. Again, we're seeing concerns around um, this sort of uh, doesn't account for human bias or error. Uh, and back to that argument on technologies, not as unbiased as people think. But we don't think it's all bad. There is opportunities here um, for people to use technologies and platforms to actually advocate for citizens, um, for tenants. So we see this in the increasing amount of platforms that are there to assist tenants and um, share information that help them secure and maintain homes. And those sites which collate information on landlords who don't meet their legal requirement, legal management requirements, so sort of like a landlord database in that respect. Um, the anti-eviction mapping project um, out of the US is an excellent example of this, which I encourage you to look at. So what does this mean? Um, oh, sorry, no, we're not there yet. <laughs> so to date, policies have largely been reactionary where significant issues have arisen because of such technologies. So we need to be on the forefront of these new technologies and preempt the ways that they may discriminate so that we can better respond to and regulate them. As we said, it doesn't have to be all bad. There can be benefit to tenants um, and they can be incorporated into advocacy efforts. So what does this mean um, for policymakers? Well, the structural nature of discrimination means that we have to look at broadly at the policies that intersect with housing. And so we can't look at discrimination in the private rental sector independently of this broader policy landscape. We advocate a holistic um, approach or response to address this structural discrimination and so this includes things such as health policy, transport, climate, ageing, immigration, etc. And we also argue for multi-scalar scalar through direct mechanisms to reduce discrimination in the private rental sector by reshaping broader property and rental markets. So we identified some several critical um, sort of and also um, areas critical policy areas that could demand immediate attention. And these range from um, interventions and tenancy sort of laws to more financial and tax um, uh, modifications. So a basic low hanging fruit option would be removing the no grounds uh, justification for evictions. Very simple, but would have immediately massive benefits to tenants. Uh, more tax and financial sort of oriented responses could be around increasing social security payments, which we saw work very well during COVID last year. Um, and things such as removing uh, negative gearing incentives for investment properties, as well as developing specific and minute, minimum quality standards for rental housing and developing professionalism across the sector. We also identified some other things to consider, which again, predominantly relate to um, a number of financial and tax sort of incentives. So this means actually using or considering incentives to build for and rent low, so, uh, low socioeconomic um, uh, housing for low socioeconomic status tenants um, and for those who experience discrimination. 
At the same time, this could lead to reducing incentives for multiple investment properties and limit the um, extent of corporate buy-ups in distressed housing contexts, which is something that happens a lot um, in the US, for example. And one of the things that is key to what we've been talking about today is better regulation of digital technologies. And this includes considering the transparency of data collection, who this data is going to and what it's being used for. Um, and also the uh, broadly banning things like rent bidding apps. I know we have been able to push back on those in Australia so far, but to make sure this continues and restricting the use of surveillance technologies, which can really just incrementally creep into the system. So, you know, sort of be aware of that before it becomes too late in that sense. So discrimination in the private rental sector become, is becoming an increasingly important policy challenge um, because we're seeing this increase of people renting. Partly this discrimination is, you know, can't be considered without, uh, you know, this broader context of the power and balance between landlords and tenants in a home owning nation. So the experiences are embedded in the context of home ownership, um, you know, where property and owners and landlords are often celebrated as good citizens and tenants are somehow being flawed and having failed to reach this, this goal of home ownership. The privileging of property ownership and investment over renting forms the basis for this power imbalance and this, full, uh, this continuing discrimination experience. An intersectional framework shows how discrimination is experienced unevenly and influenced by policies beyond those specifically addressing uh, the rental sector and housing provision. And people are more likely to experience discrimination and its effects if they identify with one or more area of disadvantage across lines of class, gender, race, disability and sexuality above others. And this is also affected by socioeconomic status and income, which shapes their choice and intersects across all other social categories impacting discrimination. So addressing private renters' experience of discrimination needs to consider these associated um, policy areas. And we identified those as, you know, we've mentioned before, health, energy, climate, racial discrimination, as well as labour policies. But it's also important to consider the two additional trends that are reconfiguring the rental sector, the growth of the informal tenancies and non-standard accommodation, so the informal housing sector, and the increasing use of digital technologies to access housing, manage property and mediate the landlord, real estate agent, tenant relationship. So these are emerging areas of influence on the rental sector and that have the potential to perpetuate discrimination and they require more research and more forward sort of preemptive thinking by policymakers on how to respond to this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia, for that incredibly thorough but insightful review of your research. Very telling um, evidence you have there. And I'd like to ask John now to reflect on this research and its implications for the sector. Thanks, John. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Sophia. And uh, to you too, Gina, as well, big thanks for this. And to Ahuri for the opportunity. So we at Shelter are very appreciative of this. And I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I'm coming to you from, which is the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, shelter New South Wales, and I'm also involved in National Shelter, and they're very keen as well to be part of this research and, and what we can do to take it from, from theory, from, from fact, to actually, you know, help it to, to lean on some of the levers that can really make a difference. I was just reflecting a couple of things as Sophia was talking. One of them was a um, uh, an old boss that I had years ago when I said I was going for a rental property. She sort of leaned on me. She said, listen, just say to them, you're only renting for six months because you're looking to buy in the area. Once you say that, it'll have a huge difference. And I thought, oh, it's not that silly. That, that, you know, why would I say that? But I was amazed at the time, and it was, it was probably late last century that I did that. But I've always held on to that, and I don't think the world has changed. I think the level of discrimination has gotten more ingrained, uh, more systemic, more disguised as discerning. I think the paper talks about the difference between discernment and discrimination. But I think, let's be clear, let's just talk about the, the elephant in the room that's by no means invisible. This is a fully clothed, fully visible elephant. Discrimination is rife increasing and moving into new areas that we hadn't thought of. So the digital um, economy, the uh, informal nature of it. And I think that the, pick, the piece that I picked up on most importantly is the intersectionality or the compounding nature of where you've got two, three or four or five of these. Interesting, just as a, a note of um, uh, uh, delight, I, I was particularly delighted watching that TV show last night, and I'm sure a few of you would have seen it as well. Um, it's the, uh, the school that is trying to end racism. 
And I was really inspired by the way, and I'm sure lots of the people on the uh, webinar today will have as well. If you haven't had the chance, ABC iView is showing it. Um, the way in which these young minds were so thirsty for the difference between discerning and discrimination and how institutional um, ingrained and how I think one of the little kids makes a great quote, which is you can't just be not like um, discrimination or racism. You've got to be against it. And I'm really thinking about that as we go into this challenge. I think Sophia and the team, so I'm thinking also, of course, of Dallas and Peter, Jacqueline and Caitlin, and, and Ahuri for sort of, you know, auspicing all of this. And, and very pleased, by the way, that Ahuri are taking this to the National Conference in March. We're all very excited to be able to see that and the combination of both digital and in person. A few of us are very much looking forward to, to being there in person. But this idea, this, I mean, to be honest, groundbreaking and comprehensive piece of research that gives people like us in the policy sphere no doubt, and, and no fear, I must say, be able to go to the policymakers and say, here it is, what else do you need to see? This comprehensive and thorough piece of research that absolutely shows the breadth, depth, and not just the, the way in which discrimination is not going away, but again, how it's increasing. So three areas that I'll pick up in particular and say thanks to Sophia on from Shelter's point of view, which is we really are champing at the bit to be able to grab this report and, and convert it and do something with it to be able to take it to the policymakers. Really, the idea about the informal economy um, I think the way in which data and um, digital uh, information is too, too often at the moment used as a, a sword, it can also be a shield. I think we need to talk about that as part of the Q&A. And also, too, just that final point about if, if it's difficult, if you're experiencing one of these lenses, imagine what it's like when it's compounded. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, a salient point. They're the three. The informal nature and the way in which it's growing, the way in which the digital divide is increasingly both a challenge and an opportunity to do something about it. And then finally, that let's be clear, there is for some people, there's a huge compounding and it's 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 cumulative. It's it's uh, it's not just uh, a small number when you've got two or three or four of these issues. It's massive. So what I'd like to say is thank you very much on behalf of industry, because we very much value um, particularly organisations like Shelter. And I know that we stand joined arms with the Tenants Union, Homelessness New South Wales, uh, New South Wales Council of Social Services. I know are on the call and aware of this today. Um, even the Community Housing Industry Association. We all link arms on knowing how important this, this research is. So again, thanks on behalf of a very grateful industry that's then able to take this information, take it to the policymakers. So policies, procedures, um, programs can all be designed to do something about it. And most importantly, politically, I think that's the, the elephant again in the room or, or the, the thing that needs to be, we need to be able to go to our policymakers and say, politicians in particular, let's do something about this. Here's the evidence. One thing I wouldn't mind touching on, and again, happy to talk about this as part of the Q&A, is we often talk about, and I know the report covers this very comprehensively, about the various current and, and further needed um, uh, stick, if you like, legislative requirements that are needed, some low-hanging fruit there around no grounds eviction, longer leases, various bits and pieces. I, I wonder sometimes when we get caught in that binary world of between carrot and stick. We often say that, you know, we need to, um, first of all, incentivise landlords. I think property owners are pretty well incentivised at the moment by the favourable property returns that they get when it comes to, you know, interest rates have fallen to their, as we often say, lowest amount in 7,000 years. And they're able to service mortgages and they've done quite well. Rents haven't dropped in substantive terms relative to interest or the cost of servicing a mortgage. So a lot of private landlords are doing quite nicely and we're able to even in a, a small way, be generous around rent, uh, the rent uh, moratorium that existed last year, where they could delay or reduce or even waive some rent. There's a number of mechanisms that the banks looked upon them very favourably. They were able to seek assistance in New South Wales and other states based on some other criteria. They were able to, um, and, and again, write off some of the losses part of negative gearing. So I don't think this idea that somehow landlords and tenants had the same uh, experiences during COVID. I think the report very clearly shows that actually tenants did much worse and some landowners did very well. In fact, were very well protected. The reason why I say that is because it, I think there's a point at which we need to talk about, and we, and we use the pejorative term, mum and dad investors, the amateur cottage industry that is um, a lot of the private rental that's provided. It's uh, basically um, an opportunity using, say, the digital world to say, how can we move beyond just the carrot and stick response? So either legislation or incentive. I wonder whether there's a new uh, opportunity here. And, and we talk about it uh, in relation to a particular scheme, which I'll just mention briefly, which is where it's not a carrot 
or a stick, but it's a star. Somehow and some way that we can formalise using the digital um, opportunity around, uh, we see it in all sorts of other um, shared economies and other ways in which there's a direct way that a good landlord, for example, can be rewarded or a principled property provider, we might call them, somebody with um, who really wants to uh, lean in and be known for and acknowledged for doing a good job and being a good landlord. And that extends beyond the legislative requirements. But that that's, uh, for example, it's like, well, I commit to a certain percentage of the income that I derive from this property every year to be returned back as not just emergency maintenance, but improvements. And I work with the tenant to be able to do that. Um, I, I can see, as, as, as Blind Freddie can see, despite Australia being one of the highest, in fact, I think the highest, uh, uh, countries in terms of take up of energy efficiency when it comes to solar, very few of that gets passed through directly to benefit tenants. So there's a really obvious area here where do we talk about carrot, do we talk about stick? What's the way that we could acknowledge a good landlord, property owner, who's principled to say, well, I want to pass through that energy saving that's available to the tenant. It's of no particular value to me, but I want to be known. So I think there is a good opportunity here for us to shift the conversation given the growth of the private rental market, and yet, ironically, not, not at this stage taken up by big REITs and so not big real estate investment trusts or and the build to rent is still, you know, burgeoning. It's not really fully fleshed out yet. At the moment, we often have, and they're characterised by, um, a mum and dad investor who uh, owns the, uh, the unit that they used to live in that was two bedroom, they invariably move a kilometre or two kilometres away. The stats about the correlation between location of investment properties and where the tenant, where the landlord is, is, is quite remarkable. And, and so it's already an emotive market. We already have people making an emotional decision, not just a pure financial one. So I think we could do well to lean into that as an industry and say, I want to capitalise on that. I want to say, you own a property that's around the corner, you rent it out are you open to the concept of being an ethical landlord? And that means really um, being open to the possibility of saying there's a star rating system, for example, that says your tenant fills out the satisfaction survey. Your tenants anonymously contribute. They, they are the ones that control the scoring sheet. So the digital um, divide or the digital opportunities exist around an app that you might be able to use that demonstrates in the same way that we, we've identified quite clearly landlords that are, are not like that. I do think it's time that we could possibly move to saying, well, we as industry need to support and get government to say why it's a good idea. Uh, principled property owners through, you know, ethical landlord uh, schemes that, that reward reward beyond the incentive of uh, negative gearing, beyond the uh, requirement of legislation, but actually says, you know, I own that property, I rent it out, and, and I want to be known for being a good landlord. We see it in other industries, whether it's buying coffee or where we buy shoes or, you know, we, we see other things. I think vicariously, most landlords want to be able to, given that it is still an emotive market, it's not purely transactional. Often there's a correlation, as I said, between where you own a property and the fact that um, you rent it out. I think we could lean into that and make a huge difference and, and capitalise on that market. Just finally, in terms of the finances, I'm, I'm always surprised at which the way in which you know, we, we just, just to finish, if I, before I throw back to Eugenia, is the way in which we, and certainly as part of Shelter and, and our, our role with National Shelter in particular, we do give feedback to organisations like the Reserve Bank, like other organisations to say, are we capturing, when we talk about housing affordability, are we talking about servicing debt or retiring it? Because even this idea of people who are borrowing huge amounts of money to own a property, in effect, because of the capital prices of properties in Sydney now north of a million dollars, you will at best pay off a portion of that property over time. So notwithstanding a big, and I know that's also talked about in the report, inheritance from family, you're really talking about a generation of people that are effectively renting from a bank for a number of years. So they're, they're almost, again, vicariously entering into a shared equity scheme. So I think when we take this argument upstream a bit, I think there's a great opportunity for banks as they increasingly lend to people who might have two, three, four, five, six properties. We might just need to have four conversations with four CEOs of the four banks and say, you need to put in place requirements that when you lend money on this scale, basically there's huge amounts of money invested in our housing industry, too much we hear from every quarter at the moment. Is there a way in which you can differentiate your service, show some of your um, ethical metal, as it were, and require some of these investors 
to demonstrate that they're going to behave as good landlords with that property and their investment moving forward. That, that That's not in and of itself a solution. What I'm saying is I think it's time that we, given the size of the private rental market growing, the number of people who will own a portion of their property at the end, not the whole lot, they won't pay down that principal, it's time that we started involving other levers within that investment realm, which is the banks, to say, you probably need to be making sure, or could you reward, again, the star system, tenants, sorry, landlords who are demonstrating a really good commitment to their tenants. It's part of the package. And in fact, I think finally, we will get to a stage where, where, where I hope banks will say, um, don't just bring me a valuation of what you think that property might be able to rent for as I lend you the money. Show me that you've got a signed lease for five years with a tenant. Let's value long leases. They are part of the investment discussion. And I think there's a maturity there. And again, the ideal, of course, is no grounds eviction. But in terms of, you know, and I'm, I'm one of those odd census newbies where I'm a rent vester, tiny little property that was just too small for us to, to have the kids in, rent a property up the road, which is bigger, it suits me. But, you know, I, I do get the the, um, the nature of it. I, I think that if we um, uh, increasingly see the maturity and the change of that market, people who own that concept or people who own properties who then rented another one, rent vestors, wasn't really around as a category, I think, three or four censuses ago. You either rented or you owned. So the fact that we've had to move, we've got a new dynamism, I think we should lean into that, create some opportunities using the digital world and incentivise, incentivise, incentivise really good landlords who aren't just doing it because they're hit over the head or because they might get some negative gearing, but because they want to be proudly rather than, I think, secretly sometimes feeling like they've got a dirty secret that they own a property in the inner west or something, that they're proud of it and they're able to say, that's something I'm really proud of and I do really well. So I think there's a big conversation that can be had. But again, absolutely so appreciative of the extraordinary and comprehensive work that's been done here that really gives us, uh, well, us on behalf of the politicians and the policymakers that we go to with such great, we're armed, there's nowhere for them to hide in terms of responding to this research. So thank you to Sophia in particular for this and, and over to you, Gina. Thank you so much, John, for such a thought-provoking response. And on that note, I just wanted to flag with our participants that Sophia and the team engaged in what is described as a scoping project. It's one of the various Ahuri research vehicles. So with the scoping project, there is a smaller budget and a smaller time frame. So it's a testament to her and the team for the excellence in the work that they've produced within those parameters. So congratulations again. But we have so many questions and I just want to dive into all of them. And I'm going to start, if I may, on a point raised by one of our participants in the Q&A. Will there ever be any significant shift in the power imbalance between landlords, whether public or private, and renters while there's such a major undersupply of genuinely affordable housing? So can we start from that point there and also encapsulate it in that notion of the subtle and overt discriminatory behaviours that we see. So, Sophia, would you like to reflect on, on that point? Yeah, that's a great question to begin with. Thanks, Gina, and to whoever suggested that question. I mean, in my um, not-so-optimistic days, I don't see that relationship, that power imbalance really changing until, you know, until there's there's a bit of a shift in either the way that we think about renters as a nation um, or whether you know there's a sort of evening out of the of the the sector again, but I really actually think it's it's the shift that is required is the way that Australia perceives renters. So unlike other countries, say in Europe, where renting's quite accepted and normal, like mm. my dad's from Holland, it's very normal when he grew up. Like my my grandmother rented all her life, and that was fine and there was no there was nothing like renters are an inferior class in that sort of concept whereas in australia because we're so embedded in this is home ownership mm -hmm. ideology like the australian dream and it's everything that we should aim for that anybody who hasn't made that who doesn't have their home is somehow flawed or a, a bad citizen in that sense and so um and we know it's increasingly hard to afford a home um so so it's not their fault it's not that they've been eating too much avocado toast and things like that it's it's the broader system and um, so i think there is either a chance where you know we know that renters the number of renters that we're um uh the number of people renting in australia is increasing so i think the attitude will begin to change and it's currently beginning to change i mean i see a lot of 
you know, an increase in in um, advocacy around better renting. You know, on, if you follow on Twitter, there's all sorts of um, um, new sort of groups to advocate this and do real almost educational sort of work around tenants as good, normal people, like well-educated, you know, not that that should make a difference, but this idea that we are not an inferior group to a homeowner who, who's probably through either intergenerational transfer of wealth or just luck been able to previously get into the market and leverage that. So I think there needs to be an attitude shift um, and that can also be encouraged by some of those policy levers that I think um, John was talking about. And, you know, yeah, being this idea of being a, a good landlord, that that begins to create some sort of status rather than just I've got this many investment properties. That's where Thanks, I am. <laughs> and, well, I forgot to add in the subtle and the overt things there, but I think that prejudice around, um, you know, renters as being somehow less than a homeowner is is one of the, well, I don't even think it's subtle, it's an overt sort of um, prejudice. Mm. And I'm just wondering, John, are you still with us? We've got a dark screen for you. Yeah. Where did John go? Pose a question. We might just give got John some space technology. We love it all, don't we? So <laughs> I've had a very early uh, question from your presentation, specifically Sophia, from one of our participants. Um, he refers to Figure One that was part of the PowerPoint oh, slides. Yes. But yeah. also, it's um, for those participants who are accessing the handouts in the yeah. final report. It's actually page twenty-one. And our um, aquarium wants to ask, how internationally applicable do you think the interse interse intersectional experience of housing model, so figure one in the report, is, and how useful do you think it is in policy terms? Mm, good question. Very, very well, good question. <laughs> very good question again. And I would say... Um, I'd say it's very um, applicable internationally. So we actually, um, you know, our concept of intersectionality actually comes from um, the US and Kimberley Crenshaw, who's a black feminist scholar and legal scholar uh, around, um, particularly because these, uh, I guess, intersections and experience of discrimination is so acute around race in the US. So I think when we look at, when we used our, um, when and we'll try and describe this in a figure, mm. <laughs> which I will point out that the visual representation of my ideas is not always my strong point. So there's probably a lot of finessing that can be done with that model, um, with that figure. But essentially, you know, anywhere where you, we know that pretty much globally there are things that will be, you know, uh, a factor for discrimination and and that can be tweaked to any sort of context um, or culture or whatever you know what's what, you know what are some of the key factors of discrimination in that particular context and then relating that to I'm just bringing up the um, you know uh, the figure here so I can refer to it as well and the policy context so I think you know the, the taxation the health and aging all of those things should be intersecting that's a global problem um, and so, yeah, I think you can just tweak it. I think, A, it's broadly applicable in its own form, but that there's a lot of tweaks that can be um, brought into it dependent on context. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, John. We lost you for a month. Yeah, back again. Back again. <laughs> Great to have you back again. I actually wanted to turn to um, the international context again to continue on mm. that vein of conversation. One of our um, querents was asking, what's it like internationally? What did you find from your literature review? Is the problem just as exacerbated? Is it overt, subtle? Could you um, expand on that for us, Sophia? Yeah, so we looked at a few examples. And of course, you know, traditionally we look to Europe and the countries mm. like Holland and Germany and Scandinavia as good examples of, you know, housing bliss, which we know is not quite true. There's an increasing privatisation of some of the markets there. But, you know, still more than over here, there's there's a good, there's a healthy balance in between renting and home ownership in terms of opportunities and affordances and security of tenure and those kind of things. I think one of the important examples in terms of, particularly around digital technologies of what can go wrong is something that we should be a little bit more um, aware of as, as a sort of like 
an experiment for it sort of happens as much over here is the US where you, you know you have um, partly enabled by corporate landlords so the huge corporate landlords over there which went in post GFC and brought up a whole heap of housing that was in distress and then you know when you look at where who owns these corporate landlords and things as trails back to border investment and you know companies it's all very interlinked but then as part of managing their portfolio they bring on all these you know, these essentially these digital systems because they can manage it remotely and this is where we see some really um, concerning problems come in because you know what might be a great solution to somebody who's got a portfolio of thousands of properties like one platform and the smart locks and things like that um, can potentially be quite uh, problematic on the ground. And there was some examples done of, um, say, um, uh, sort of smart locks or biometric. I can't remember which one it was. It was uh, either the biometric assets or the smart locks in an um, apartment tower in New York in an area which is traditionally a black area. And the residents felt, for example, that the building was already heavily sealed, um, that this was just really a step too far because it would monitor every time you came in and out. It could take photos of your visitors were, that kind of thing. And while the management company's um, excuse was that it was for better safety of the residents, they actually linked this to the residents that fought back and pushed back it's really to enable further gentrification of the area and sort of using these technologies to push people out. Um, and there's a lot of concern around, say, uh, communities where uh, you might have illegal immigrations or undocumented um, um, migrants not living there, that this information is actually shared, particularly the biometric data. I mean, that's crazy that you have to give up your biometric data to enter your home. Like, that's ridiculous and do we see a lot of that in australia these these i find the notion of these smart locks while they might be perceived in the sector as efficient i find them wholly disturbing so do we, yes. do we see the use of those in us in the australian in the australian setting so again we didn't see too much of that yeah i think that's partly because of what we referred to again as earlier on the the mum and dad landlords that kind of thing because you know in the us it's it's the corporate landlord nature makes that very efficient and easy so what i am concerned about is when we have these broader like what we're seeing the sort of broader build to rent developments whether these systems get um put in as 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 from the beginning um we know that co-living developments so they've sort of taken off um often have smart systems and things like that as well so um there will be some around but it's not quite at the scale but i think that's partly because of the way our sector uh, at the moment isn't uh, you know like it's a mum i hate using that term, mum, dad, <laughs> small that's scale that. investors <laughs> small scale investors but i mean i do know stories and you know of, of people who have had these applied um yeah so yeah. But again, it's something that, oh, sorry, just to follow on, no. uh, somebody raised a, a big point about this uh, at work the other day, which was, you know, because we're talking about this and people are like, oh, well, it's not really here yet, so it's not a problem. But, you know, we weren't prepared, say, for things like Airbnb and Uber and all of these kind of things. And I think the sort of rapid digitalization of housing and the rental sector is something that unless we start looking at these examples that are creeping in here will be potentially quite disruptive. And I might turn to John on that point around um, the emergence of the informal rental sector and in your experience with Shelter New South Wales, the increase of that and how this is obviously going to exacerbate this situation. Although maybe not, John has dropped out again. Well, Sophia, I might pose that question to you. With this increase of the informal rental sector, how is this, it's obviously not regulated, hence the nature of the description mm. informal. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how that's really exacerbating the experience of discrimination? Yeah. So, I mean, it's partly, again, because there's there's the less... So the people who are accessing the informal rental sector are generally, again, those who don't have either the relevant documents in terms of rental references or the financial sort of details to to go into the the formal rental sector so that's something just as um if i think about 
you know, even share housing, you know, your bond is four weeks of an individual room rent rather than four weeks of a property rent. Um, there's a lot of informal networks too between communities around this kind of stuff. And what we found was that in some research that, um, you know, an Ahuri regular, Nicole Garan and her co colleagues did around informal housing is that um, often um, discriminatory in terms of the impacts of um, the actual threat to tenants around health and safety. Like some of these uh, dwellings are quite uninhabitable and um, pose serious risks. But in terms of, um, you know, if I link it back to sort of the discrimination, the overt sort of discrimination, is that there's far more reign to go, well, you know, you you are of a background that I don't want in my house or, you know, you, you, you aren't the type of person that I want. And I've seen you know, in some of the interviews that I've done around share housing and people um, trying to access share housing either via the platform or in that once they've made through. So there's a couple of layers. So they might, people were very good at presenting, creating a profile on the platform that would get them through these initial stages of just, you know, filters of just um, around discriminatory things. And then they would get to the interview and it would be like, oh, look, you know, I had one girl say, because she looked Asian, even though she'd gone through the first bit, they thought she wouldn't fit with their, you know, essentially new town lifestyle, something like that. And at the other end, I had another participant who was saying the ad said Asians only, I'm Asian. I went there and they said, oh, no, you're not the type of Asian that we want. We were thinking someone more South Asian than you, that kind of thing. So they're very explicit. Um, experiences of discrimination, they're right to your face. They're like, you're not quite for us and this is why. Um, so I think this is where it is. And there's no, you know, in the formal sector, why that might be more subtle, as I say, like an agent being more accommodating of someone they think is better fit. Um, there are, there's not that, like they can't just, technically there's more um, sort of, I guess, regulation around that. So it's the lack of regulation and, and those things there. Mm. And also, it's opening it a doorway, into, isn't it? Sorry, Sophia. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh no, and I was just going to say, it probably also taps into people who are less familiar with the rental system and their rights. So yeah, it takes advantage of that. And John, how do you find the impact of the informal, the emerging informal rental sector um, in your work you do with Shelter New South Wales? So, so a couple of things, and I hope you can hear me okay, Gina and Sophia. Sorry yes, for okay. that technology problem. Okay. <laughs> yeah, is um a couple of things I'd say just to highlight. So, so really um, at the other end of the room, if you like, it's well established, the, the informal, you know, backed up by the digital. A couple of things that are probably less well known, but in, indicate how um, fraught that can be. So one thing that we heard as part of our research into uh, supporting the changes in New South Wales towards new generation boarding houses is that somebody um, put in a sort of a submission or a paper to us that said, suggested that the new generation boarding houses, which are very small micro apartments, at the price point are actually meant to be an alternative for people who would otherwise only have the option of forced share housing. So such is the experience with share housing where, where people go, I would rather live in a smaller dwelling, it's a little bit more expensive, that's a micro apartment than have to share. Mm -hmm. so, so I think we've already crossed this Rubicon where, you know, sharing accommodation, real or perceived, apart from um, some situations is relegated to something temporary, something you do while you're a student, something you do for a period of your life. But, you know, as you get older, you wouldn't, you wouldn't choose it. And then I think there's a whole other discussion there about shared kitchens and bathrooms and, and en suites. So, again, apologies if you can um, hear me but not see me. So, yeah, so and another thing, we know already that um, the informal market has some attractiveness because of those reasons that have been outlined. But even the build to rent sector highlights sometimes as one of its advantages, which almost seems a bit perverse, because it certainly doesn't result necessarily in longer leases, but not having to pay a bond, not having to pay a bond is a material thing. So anything that basically shifts the, mm. the obvious barriers to entry, I've got a, a, a good reputation or a good job, or uh, I've got a bond or whatever, we, we see by, the, by looking at the sidelines almost, how important and how much the informal housing market is increasingly um, something that needs to be understood because of the artefacts around it that are pointing it to it being a bigger issue. So yeah, that idea that somehow build to rent is attractive because it doesn't require a bond and people mm. um, very being very vocal with us saying, I don't mind living in a micro apartment or a new generation boarding house because it's an alternative to forced, not ideal, not ideal and certainly not secure private rental accommodation and share housing it demonstrates that there's a bigger issue that needs unpacking. Mm. Mm. Sophie, did you want to respond? 
Oh, I think I think you know the the idea around um, the bond as a major part of forcing people to into um, I guess um, accommodation options that aren't ideal because they can't afford a month's payment is um, one of the big um, obstacles to housing and one of the option why why we find um, even things like which are kind of like that the co-living those kind of things um, which aren't always considered affordable but are quite an appealing option for those who who just who are also quite mobile um, prior to COVID as well like the ability to come in and you know if, uh, the way that our leasing system works with you finding references evidence of income all of that kind of stuff can be particularly hard for people who are new to the country might not have their local bank um, details set up yet that kind of stuff um, so I think those mechanisms why I know they're there for a reason um, often are, are quite um, challenging so you know making people aware maybe around bond installments rather than taking a loan that kind of stuff could be an option um and i was just thinking before when the build to rent um sorry i just got my pen caught in my hair um uh, was mentioned by john and linking that back to some of those smart technologies before i think um i think megan nethercote um and um also alicia bennett down at um various parts of Melbourne, um, have been doing some work around these technologies in the built rent sector. So that's something maybe I'd be keen to see from them mm -hmm. in the future. And on that note, Ahuri Evidence Base includes, you would know one of your colleagues, Caitlin Buckle, doing work last year yeah. in regard to the COVID-19 research um, around the informal um, arrangements and informal um, rental sector, really telling evidence in those mm -hmm. reports as well, all available on the Ahuri website, of course. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, there's a question coming through about, you know, what do you do when there's 40 people applying for a property? Uh, and that's not an uncommon situation in Australia. Yeah. Um, the question directly is also when there are 40 applications for each apartment, what incentive would be relevant or effective with good landlords? How could they respond to that type of demand that would be seen as um, equitable? It's, it's challenging. That's a really good question. And I don't know whether I actually have an, an answer for that. Like, I, I'm not sure. Um, you know, which also reminds me of being an earlier... <sighs> You know, there's a lot of this, uh, I guess, the digitalization of um, of these processes and things, you know, like the rent bidding apps and things are just like a digitalization of processes that were already occurring in terms of offering more rent than the advertised rent, blah, blah, blah. So maybe it's actually bringing to the fore, making more visible some of these practices that, you know, were happening underground a little bit more or underneath the sort of mm. the advertisement table. So not as, I guess bluntly out there but yeah actually that's a really good question and i don't i don't know how you would um deal with that so i guess um yeah you'd have to think about that as a good landlord i think in one way it's there's maybe room for what john was saying before around length of um lease length length of the lease time and tenure security over the long term so um maybe that's something that might be of a, a sorting factor in that term, but then think about people who only want a short term rental. Um, so that's a really tricky um, and something that's sort of beyond the scope of what we looked at in the report, but I would suggest would be a really interesting angle for more research. So thank you. And so we also, um, I'm looking um, at the um, executive summary of the work, Sophia, and launching from that about professionalism and standards within mm. property management there is a question that we received quite early in your presentation that talks and it, it's quite confronting how do i deal with rude and unprofessional real estate agents yeah it's very challenging this person's obviously had some negative experiences and feels that that, that that they've not been treated well yeah um totally agree it's really hard because you know there's again that uneven power balance you're the the real estate agent is the one who, you know, can eventually sort of advise the landlord who to choose that kind of um, thing and can be very blunt and very dismissive. And they're not my, you know, I've had some pretty awful experiences too. And always I get the sense that I've done something wrong just by bringing them up to say something. But um, in those cases as well, I think it's really important to get in touch with, you know, people 
like good people at the Tenants Union of New South Wales who can help you um, work out ways to respond and push back. Um, just an anecdote, I had a friend recently who was, you know, being something was a bit amiss with the way that the, the real estate agent was dealing with her, um, called the hotline and found out what he was doing was illegal. Um, so she was able to put that in her response and then they backed off. So I think knowing your rights again as a as a tenant is really cool um, because we don't tend to to know, like we just sort of, so think about my own history. I don't think I signed a lease for about 15 years of my share housing life and I thought that was great at the time because it meant I could just bounce whenever I wanted and then when I started doing research like this I was like oh dear that could have ended up really terribly but I wasn't even aware of the sort of I guess the laws and my rights as a renter and how that affected that so yeah being being um, across that is powerful and important so put the tenants unions on your radar and that's great, Sophia. It actually addresses a question from one of our participants. Um, do you have any practical suggestions on how renters can effectively advocate for themselves in the rental market? And certainly the Tenants mm. Union is um, is a very helpful and supportive organisation, very um, accessible across all different jurisdictions in Australia. Yeah. So we and, might talk and I think, oh, sorry. And I was just going to say on a broader scale too, I mean, I think in the end, if we want real change, then it comes down to voting at you know, it comes down to politics and who's in power. And so I think the more sway the renting sector gets as a demographic of voters, make sure, you know, I know housing policy doesn't really, beyond investment, often, fact, you know, that's something that campaign to your member, your local member, um, those kind of things as well. Hmm. I'd like to pose a question to John, but I don't think he's there at the moment. No. It's very Poor sad. John. Oh, it's frustrating with technology. It, it can be unpredictable at different times. So looking at um, the informal nature and growth of the digital divide. So when applying, you mentioned earlier, the application process for, um, for a tenancy, for a property. Can you talk a little bit more about that in regard to the experiences of the people that you engaged with mm. in the research? Yeah, so I mean, increasingly we're seeing like, um, you know, a lot of the application stuff coming online and um, standard forms and, you know, that affects those, well, as we can see already, the, the difference in digital connectivity and access that's happening just in this session. But so those who, um, who don't have reliable access, um, you know, um, who either afford it or the infrastructure is not as, as reliable there, feel even um, uncomfortable filling out forms online. There's some, you know, there's some issues there around um, equitable ability to apply for a rental. And we also see that this is, um, you know, particularly again, looking at the US because this research tends to be um, sort of, you know, quite there's quite a lot of strong research there is that actually as well, um, again, this is mediated by, um, you know, things like your cultural differences um, um, and inequalities along, again, those factors around race, class, age, um, you know, and the comfortable, how comfortable you feel using these forms and, and putting a profile up online. So, so, for example, you know, there's the forms now that most real estate agents will use if you're applying, but there's also the online profile. So if you're going through Gumtree or Flatmates, that kind of stuff. So not a lot of not everyone feels comfortable putting a profile up online. Um, it can be, you know, you don't even know sometimes um, um, around the validity of the information on the ad, that kind of stuff. So there are a few of the issues there, um, you know, so uh, from the spectrum of actual problems of access to and ability to use the internet and digital technologies, and then the problems down the spectrums to actually how comfortable you feel, um, you know, again, how you present yourself on there, um, women might feel, you know, less comfortable and certain groups might feel less comfortable in some ways putting details up as opposed to a group that experiences less sort of prejudice and discrimination. John, I'm wondering if you can comment, there's a question that's come through to our Q&A um, about the effectiveness of the current approach to enforcement of discrimination rules themselves in your conversations in the sector. 
how do you think that this issue is recognised and the narrative around it? Are people talking about discrimination and discriminatory behaviours in the private rental sector? Um, two things. Uh, again, apologies. You can clearly tell that I'm a renter in the building here. So I'm not, I'm not an owner, given the digital uh, the digital capacity of our, of our office. Um, look, two things I'd say is, and there is that sort of concept of the conflict of laws between um, discrimination law and tenancy law. But at the end of the day, I think at the moment, it's too easy to, to, we know this and the report reinforces this, it's too easy for it not even to get to that level where it's formal, overt, obvious discrimination. Mm. It's, it's discernment, it's, 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 it's disguised as some sort of other process. So I think that's the problem. It's very difficult to be able to pin it down. So without any major changes, I can't see that um, moving too much. There's a lot of people saying, what can you do? I, I don't know that the, there are either not enough of them or the legislative instruments are way at the end. It's a bit like eviction. By the time that you're, you're talking about an eviction, it's, it's well past the transactional thing. Just going back one step, I think um, what I what I think could be worthy of some further attention, and, and all of us have got these stories. I, I know that Sophia was talking about it. Sometimes I think that um, there's a tran lost in translation uh, uh, thing that happens between the landlord, property owner, someone who, who has the power, and the tenant. And the real estate agent actually is actually working in some ways against both. They're not necessarily uh, bringing together the common interests of a, of a good-minded landlord who wants a five-year lease and uh, a tenant who wants one. We've all seen experiences of that. And I'm reminded of an anecdote that somebody from our office told us recently where they turned up to do the inspection. It was an hour or two after the inspection was meant to be, but the owner happened to be there and the landlord wasn't and managed to negotiate a very good longer-term lease because the relational um, uh, opportunity of the tenant to meet the landlord, it's very easy to not like someone who you've never met. But when you meet someone and you look them in the eye and they go, well, I actually want to look after your property. And by the way, I've got a dog. Oh, that's good. So do I. I actually think there's an opportunity there. And sometimes I think the role of the real estate industry, real estate agents, and some of them, a lot of them are well-meaning, but there's definitely a piece that we're missing in this puzzle around education, awareness, training. And just to get back to that earlier question, I think there are mechanisms where you could say a landlord says, I specifically want, like it's almost reverse discrimination, right? I really want, and we've had this recently, a family to move in with children and a pet for a long time. I, I, I want that. So please don't come to me and say, oh, I've culled them and only single people and only people. That's not what I want. So again, I, I think there's an opportunity here. Let's be clear. Mm -hmm. Most property, the pejorative term, mum and dad, amateur. What was the term you used before? Sorry, Gina. Um, oh, small-scale investors. Small-scale investors. They're not, they don't tend to have 10, 20, 30 or 50, right? So, so they have a vested interest in saying, and be, whether it's being able to tell their friends at night or put their head on the pillow, I did good. Today, I made the decision that helped uh, a family get secure housing with a dog and, and that's for years. I, I think we, we need to capitalise on that, while it still is um, an amateur or a cottage industry. Mm -hmm. There's some opportunity. And so I think just in a, in a, in a nutshell, sorry to, to go on about it, but I think real estate agents, education, awareness, rewarding them as well. But good old-fashioned education, a good old-fashioned um, requirement of a, a day or two's training, what it's like. My own situation, again, we, we always think about these things, housing such an emotive and personal issue, unbeknownst to us where we live at the moment. The real estate agent didn't declare this, but the owners live next door, right? So the owners live next door. Well, that was sort of found out after we admitted. And you go, oh, right, okay, the owners live next door. It's very easy to convince the owners of the need to replace the 40-year-old air conditioning unit when it goes all night next to their bedroom window. It was a bit of a no-brainer. I just turned it on at hours at night and, and they so very quickly realised that it was within their interest. So it's a good metaphor. I think sometimes we lose the relational connectivity between landlord mm -hmm. and power tenant um as the person who's sub you know subjugated to that if we if we take away sometimes the intermediary who prevents the reality of the relationship or, or what's the opportunity of, to house someone it's it's homes we're providing it's not just um shares they're not sort of um uh, they're, they're not uh, they are related to emotion i think there's some great opportunities there and, and you wouldn't be saying this if we were talking about <clears throat> other industries necessarily but housing is such a fundamentally emotive subjective issue and that's why we've got such tenants and, you know, I got a 90 day eviction during the um, uh, pandemic middle of last year. It was a not for profit organisation, big church, lots of property, no problems at all. As soon as the uh, moratorium was up, 90 day eviction. So, so I know and I reminded myself at the time, pinch, pinch yourself, don't ever forget how awful this feels.
because you forget mm. once you win again and you're halfway through the lease and it's two years, you think, oh, that's okay. It's horrific. Moving house is horrible. It, it's it's up there. All the psychologists tell us how damaging it is after death of a spouse, a relationship breaking down a moving house. It really is an emotive issue. Your whole world is literally upside down. So let's lean into that and, and create a groundswell of landlords, principal property providers who get that, make sure that they employ and engage agents that also get it and almost build a, a, a counter force that's more shield than sword when it comes to protecting vulnerable tenants' rights. Yeah. Thank you, John. I feel to say there are very good news stories out there in the private rental sector. I'm sure the three of us have experienced those alongside the challenging experiences. But today we are focusing on an issue that is emerging and is serious. And, and with it comes those, those experiences of disappointment when we're treated poorly or we have an experience in the private rental sector that is not in line with legislative requirements because it involves that human side and I concern that digital economy and digital technologies will actually um, negate that humanity that occurs, as you say, John, when you meet someone and there's that interchange and interaction. Sophia, did you want to speak on that um, on that matter? Yeah, while I was listening to John as well, I was sort of thinking, so when um, one of the, which hasn't yet materialised, but one of the sort of things we were looking at um, when these platforms started developing and playing a bit, you know, a much more prominent role, I mean, I know we've always had classified ads and things like that mm -hmm. and notice boards, but whether um, what the role of the real estate agent becomes, because in some way it could actually bypass the real estate agent completely, like it could just go from the tenant to the landlord. And so I think the property sector, the real estate sector was very quick to identify that as a, potential threat that could do them out of a job and sort of, um, I guess, expand their repertoire to property management and all of these sort of things. So they've been quite, um, I guess, responsive and proactive in sort of um, maintain, like reestablishing how important they are in the process. And I, I, and I, I guess, um, you know, because essentially, if you could just connect with your landlord, I mean, there are some issues there, which is why we have property and real estate managers in the first place so that we don't directly have these channels. But I do wonder, um, you know, it's a bit of a, a catch-22 because in one way there's all this, um, you know, concern and literature and baits around the sort of dehumanising impact of technology and the anti-social sort of nature of it, yet at the same time, it can be quite enabling. I mean, we're speaking here today and we've got people, I'm assuming, tuning in from overseas, which wouldn't have been possible um, without it. So I think it comes back to the same thing around some of our concerns about the platforms, around inherent bias and that technology is not, um, you know, not this objective thing. But thinking about when you're actually designing the product and you're making it, what are these factors that you're factoring? Like, how are you enabling relationships? Where are you sort of, what are the options um, for communication and channels of communications and um, just sort of that broader framework of thinking around the actual beginning of it? Um, because I think, you know, you, know, you also have examples of where, say, it's easier in some ways to get something done through an app to your management, like going, I need this repaired rather than emailing them and it getting lost in the emails and not getting back to you for like a week or so. So, um, yeah, that's an interesting question, which I think I've only haven't answered, but I've just skirted around. So sorry about that. <laughs> that's my thoughts. <laughs> I actually wanted to um, turn to some comments that you made, John, during your response uh, to Sophia's research about this notion of, we talked about carrot and stick, but about STAR, about utilising this digital technology to really um, bring to the foreground people in the private rental sector in that field that are, are doing great things and to draw attention to them, because I'm sure there are many private owners, real estate agents that are in that space. Would you like to talk more sure. about that? Um, two things I'd say. One, one already, and not, not known to many people, so we'll often look to the community housing sector as, you know, um, a bit of an innovator around certain products. <clears throat> I know that Bridge Housing, I think I'm not talking out of turn here, has a scheme that, for example, if you rent your private property through them, 
So irrespective of the uh, existing negative gearing mechanisms that you might already have or your bank or whatever, but if you rent it through them um, at a discounted rate, and I'm sure they're not the only now real estate agent who has the uh, real estate aspect of a CHP that has this, so community housing provider, there's a number of others, so it's not just a one-off tax ruling. The extent to which you discount that property by, so say it's $100 or $150, whatever it is you clear off the top, is able to be uh, deducted as a, as, a, as a gift recipient. It's like a donation that you're giving. So there's already an opportunity, not particularly well known, but that's a really good example of other things apart from the obvious carrot and stick that already exists. I know, I know it's a financial one, but it just sort of shows that there is innovation, there is opportunity, there's, there's possibility there for people to be able to say, look, I own a property, it was my auntie's, we got it, we paid it off, I want to do good. I don't want to sell it, but I don't want to pretend that I don't have it anymore either. Again, as I said before, I'm a bit over the dirty little secret that I own this unit, right? So where's the opportunity to be able to lord that and say, we rent it through a CHP, it's registered. It is demonstrably contributing towards affordable housing or social housing. So you might say, yeah. I as a landlord commit to that being, um, even if they say it's the same market rent, but I commit to spending 3% of the income per year back on repairs, I commit to spending um, two percent on improvements, and I commit to spending one percent on energy saving over the life of the lease for three years. So there's no requirement to do that at the moment, but you could do that and reward a landlord, and so they get a star every time they do that. Or conversely, where you say, "I commit to renting it at," uh, and you, you know, again, you, you have a system in place that rewards this, up, and, you know, um, backed up by an app and data and everything that shows it digitally. This particular landlord rents it at. 75% of the market rent. They, they are contributing to affordable housing for key workers, essential workers, cleaners, caretakers, checkout operators, who COVID has taught us are essential. Even better, wouldn't it be great? And we, we all know people who could do this. Say, I've got that property, it was aunt so-and-so's, you know, I mean, I sound like we're talking about the small end of the room, but there's enough of these people that it could prove the rule or prove a bit of a, an opportunity here. I'm happy to rent that at social housing rents. So I'm happy to say to you, community housing organisation, I want that property rented for what is 30% of that person's income. I want to contribute to the stock of social housing. So that's something that we've not thought of. I mean, we can all turn our pull our hair out, look, waiting for the for the for the great um, stimulatory uh, requirements of more social housing that's not being built. We're, we're, we're flat out trying to get to five percent or maintain five percent in any real jurisdiction. As a proportion of um, property, social housing is just maintaining. In fact, it's going backwards. We're selling more than we're developing or re redoing. Is there other informal ways at the other end of the room that we could make a difference without without it necessarily being building more social housing? So what are the mm -hmm. leads that could, um, and that, that's just an example of one of them. So again, I think that idea of incentivizing stars, um, rewarding, and, and really not everyone, and I'm not suggesting anyone be forced to do this, but I think there's enough reasonably minded, ethical, principled property providers who would see value in a scheme like this. Where they, and they sign up and they commit to it and they get assessed and they get randomly audited and somebody interviews their tenants to find out whether they really are. We see this in other industries. We see it in employment. We reward good employers who maintain good employment and we check in regularly. There's no reason why we can't apply some of the non-housing mechanisms and the STAR or the, the incentive system or the, yeah, not just carrots, not just sticks, but some sort of incentivised reward way in which people can put their head down at night. Given it's an emotive issue, housing is always an emotive issue, let's lean into that and, and, and really compel people to do the right thing, not just the easy thing. Mm. We're coming very close to our time. I'm just wondering, Sophia, would you like to offer some closing thoughts, a commentary? about today's presentation and our questions. I apologise to our participants for the questions I haven't been able to reach, but we've managed to cover quite a lot of them. Yeah, thank you, Gino. Um, again, just thank you for having us here today. And I think just to reflect on, you know, this was a scoping report, so it's sort of a lot smaller scale than, say, some of the other every reports. And, and the report I did indicate that, you know, we need to do a lot more research in this area. We've identified it as a growing area of concern, but how that plays out still needs to, um, you know, we really uh, need to get dive more deeply into it um, to, to sort of figure out the nitty gritty bits of it. And I think um, so going forward, that's something um, that's required. And I guess another part of that and part of that further research is actually you know, whether you're um, a government or um, 
another research, whatever, it's making that data or even the real estate agent, I don't know. It's making the data available um, on, on, you know, things like evictions and things like that. So we really can um, get in to know the context a lot more deeply. So I think more research and also that this is just going to be in a continuing growing problem as we have more renters. So um, that's, that's my concluding thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, I did note from your report the excellent recommendations around accessibility to data, which will help yeah. further in future research is so valuable. And John, yeah. would you like to offer some closing thoughts and comments? Yeah, just that, that I did. Um, it's funny, I was highlighting the executive summary earlier again today and the word data, data, data came up so many times. I think that's what's the real clarion call here is we just need more irrefutable data and evidence. This is um, showing that that more, not less is needed. And and I think increasingly, just a couple of things to reflect on from, from ours. Again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the research. Thank you for the energy and the passion. Again, it is a an area that people find it difficult, I think sometimes rightly, to separate the personal response from their mm -hmm. professionalism, from their politics. It's, it's something that people carry. Housing is such an emotive issue. So this is great for us to be able to take this information, convert it, use it, and certainly um, walk it around the various corridors that we need to to make sure it converts into um, political action. Um, I think just the interesting point, I, I don't think I noticed this until recently, we tend to think, is it a local issue? Is it a state issue? Is it a federal issue? I think Safir made the point to start with, this is increasingly an international issue, mm. that, which is, you know, like all through COVID, we're seeing reports of this disparity between those who owned property pre and those who rent. And and, and that's that this whole, and this whole essays that were caught about it over the weekend, the, the way in which capital has just, you know, found a way to be able to um, get around the, the crisis of COVID and low interest. It just moves mm -hmm. into that further divide. So so I do think it's a, it's a really important issue. It's not going away. It needs more, not less energy and attention. And again, just to re uh, re reflect again, um, Sophia's main, I think, take homes that I've got, this is really about the compounding nature. Some people aren't just experiencing one, two, three, or four, but lots of these, and it's it's exponential. It's not just you know mathematical and cumulative. It's exponential. The 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 effects of the discrimination, the digital is is both. I think a shelter. Uh, sorry, a, um, a sword and a shield. I think there's an opportunity there, and yeah, and I think we can't. Um, and I know in New South Wales, there's a planning instrument at the moment we're looking at for co-living. I think again, we need to probably lean into that and realise that informal housing. You know, and renting, and I think we use an adage which is, um, let's let's rent, not buy. Here's why we need to sort of probably have a lot more of those. Well, there's lots of advantages that go with it. You get to have your own kitchenette, bathroom, and a shared kitchen space. You get to live in a building that allows you to have your own space, but rent on occasion the room two doors away for when somebody comes to stay or you get access to the rooftop. I mean, those sorts of things. I think, again, leaning into my sort of word of the day, we need to lean into some of the more informal, informal, I'm, I'm learning that word informal, saying, well, what does good informal look like as opposed to bad? And some of the good informal mm. things I think are really worth celebrating. I think the, um, finally, the idea that we seduced as the word, seduced lots of people from political, economic and social problems in Europe who, who didn't own land, to come to Australia because you could own a piece of land and it was a house, in two or three generations we've gone from that to, you know, the most urbanised city in the world, 40% of our population in some areas living in rented units. That's a big that's a big policy sphere that we need to be aware of when we're looking at this. So, yeah, the international levers and what's happening at a global level I think can't be divorced from this argument down on the policy level as well. But thanks. Thanks very much again, Jenna. And, again, Sophia, great work to you and the team. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. This has been great. Thanks. Thanks to you both so much. So we've each reached the end of the webinar and I sincerely wanted to thank Sophia and John for speaking today and for your time, your valuable time. And a quick reminder that we would appreciate your feedback by completing our short survey that will be sent to you later today. And if you want to share this webinar with any colleagues, it will be on our website shortly. And until we see you again, hopefully in person, thank you so much for joining us today. All right, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.